Dr. Stack, thank, thank you for your time. Hi, Renee. It's good to be back. Yes, good to have you. So I want to start off talking about, since we've last spoken, there's been some developments with children. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, pediatric multi-symptom inflammatory syndrome, PMIS, and right. we've had a couple of cases in Kentucky. Can you explain to us the connection between this PMI, PMIS and COVID-19? Right, and the CDC has even renamed it now, So, I, and I don't know the name off mm -hmm. the top of my head, but they've come up with a new description. So. Uh, for some infections, the immune system seems to get uh, hyperactive and then essentially wage war on, its, uh, on the body itself. And so uh, Kawasaki's disease is one of those syndromes. And so some of the symptoms that, children have ident that we've seen in children are similar to Kawasaki's syndrome. So, and which is what? So people can have um, fever, abdominal pain, runny nose, uh, watery eyes, a rash, mm -hmm. uh, and just generally feel poorly. It can affect the uh, blood vessels in your body, your heart, uh, your kidneys. Um, mm -hmm. It can be pretty severe illness. And in fact, a number of the children who have had this, particularly in, in the United Kingdom where it was first reported, I think, and then in New York, have uh, respiratory or circulatory collapse. So their blood pressure drops. They have to be put on a ventilator. Um, it, they're very, very sick. And it, it's life-threatening. And multiple right. children have died from this. The challenge with it, though, is the children, for the most part, as I understand it, appear to not show many signs of COVID. Mm -hmm. And then this could be six to eight weeks after they've recovered from the infection, and then they have this problem. So it's particularly difficult because by the time they manifest these symptoms, they may be very ill already. So that I will segue to the conversation about reopening. How concerned are you for this particular population uh, when Kentucky, the week that we're having this conversation, this show, restaurants, retailers, folks under the number, uh, number of 10 folks can gather, uh, travel ban is, is lifted all in time for the Memorial Day holiday. How are you concerned about the vulnerability of that particular group? So when we talk about children, the statistics overall are that children do very well. In fact, most of them don't show symptoms. And even for this new syndrome, it still happens rarely as a percent mm -hmm. of the total. The, the problem is something like Kawasaki's uh, syndrome, this disease, one of the articles I saw suggested that this, the uh, post-COVID infection version of this in children was a 40-fold increase in the frequency from what we typically had seen for Kawasaki-like illnesses. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, though it is uncommon, if you get it, it's really bad and it could be a life-ending condition. And so, you know, the, the, the consequence is severe. So even if it only happens to a few, it's something that we really want to avoid. As far as how concerned am I about reopening, I'm very concerned. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very worried that, that, in general, the public is becoming too comfortable that this is not a danger, that they are not going to take as seriously as they need to the things we're urging them to do. Now, I, I have said all along, I think I've said here in the studio before, I believe we should try to inspire people to do the right thing, not coerce people to do the right thing. So I try to just inform and try to be factual. This is not influenza. This is, to say this is influenza would be like saying that a rowboat is a cruise ship or to say that a firecracker from the 4th of July is a thermonuclear bomb. They're not the same things. People get influenza. Influenza can be serious. People can die from influenza. With COVID, if it happens in a, in a big way, if it, if it really starts to take hold, it overwhelms hospitals, and people complain that they have to wait 30 minutes to see a doctor in an ER or an hour to see a doctor. Imagine this. Imagine you call 911 and no one shows up, ever because all the ambulances are already consumed. Imagine you go to the hospital, there are no beds to treat you, there are no doctors or nurses because the facility is overrun. This is, a, in, this is not being dramatic. This happened in China. This happened in Northern Italy. This happened in New York. This is serious. And so when we talk about wearing a mask whenever you're in public, uh, washing your hands with soap and water and using hand sanitizer and practicing social distancing. Even you and I are more than six feet apart here. This is very important. I would urge the viewers that not to focus on what other people are doing if they're disregarding it. For your own safety and for the safety of those you love, I urge everybody, if you see someone without a mask or someone who's violating social distancing, you may want to stay clear because they are particularly high risk for getting this infection. 
And the one thing we can't control is how we individually choose to behave. So I urge everyone to take this extra care and precaution. And folks over the age of two, children under the age of two, should not wear masks. Is that the recommendation? But right. children older than two and adults should wear masks at all times, uh, even if you can social distance? So with any recommendation, there are always circumstances where, where safety, the, the balance of risk benefit shifts. Children under two, we say don't have them wear a mask because they can't properly wear it. Mm -hmm. There could be other risks. They may not breathe properly. They, you know, there, there are other issues. Uh, people who are otherwise incapacitated and can't safely wear a mask, maybe they have an intellectual disability or some other or behavioral disability, probably it will have difficulty with this. If you do certain types of work, it could mm -hmm. be that in that situation it's not safe for various reasons. But overwhelmingly, if you're going to go out in public, if you're going to be in a situation where you can't be more than six feet away from everyone, certainly if you go into a business, of any sort where you're interacting face, to, interacting face to face like this, you should wear a mask for your own safety and the safety of others. And not to touch your mask, uh, right. take your mask. I mean, certain times, of course, our conversation would, would be inhibited if we both wore masks, right. but uh, there is a, a tendency to fidget with the mask when you have one. When I wear one throughout the day, right. I have to say that I'm probably handling it more than I should. And so so talk last, about time, mask last time we were here, yeah. we did this in the hall, right. and, I sh and I was demonstrating with the whole crew out in the hallway because um, one of your uh, crew members uh -huh. was touching the mask that she was wearing. Right. And I was observing how frequently you touch your face, touch your eyes, touch your ears. You have to be very careful when you use a mask not to touch your face more often. And when you take it off to grab the elastic behind your ear and pull it around like this, mm -hmm. you don't want to be grabbing the front. Right. So it does take some training. Even so, people will get better with that. The, the mask is important. And I've come, I've even transitioned on my own with this because since we're going to have to allow society to do things, and, and I've been very clear, I think, on this, Renee, I really, really appreciate the economic difficulty this has brought about for people. That's, there's no one making light of that. That is very serious. It's its own catastrophe. The, the problem is, I still don't think people realize, less than 5% of Kentuckians have probably been infected which means 95% or more are still vulnerable, which means the entire crisis we have successfully averted is still waiting to happen. And so if people go right back to where we were back in February and don't socially distance and don't do these enhanced measures we're recommending, the risk of the very crisis we have so successfully as Team Kentucky prevented mm -hmm. could very well happen in June and July. And I guess that raises a question, Dr. Stack, about the timing of even moving back some of these uh, restrictions, such as uh, the folks in under 10 gathering and all of this kind of in preparation for Memorial Day, sometimes it may appear a little counterintuitive. If you feel that people are already lax and gotten comfortable, would that, with the travel season upon them and them going across state lines and even easing their own kind of guard, do you not fear that this particular weekend alone you're going to see a significant spike in cases by easing up some of these restrictions at that time? So I am fearful of the consequences of, of people relaxing their guard for social distancing. Uh, even as I drove to the Capitol today, there's more cars on the road, mm -hmm. there's more people around. Uh, when I've been out and, and watched people as I'm driving by, yesterday I went for a walk in the neighborhood. There were clearly a bunch of people out not social distancing in my neighborhood, and they were not all from the same family. Right. I'm very worried about that. But here's the challenge, right? We rely on the multitude of people to do what needs to be done. We, we can't enforce this. We're not going to send police officers to arrest folks. Mm -hmm. We have to try to educate people and help them to understand why this is so critical. And so if, if we set down rules that people just will not follow, th then we run into a real trouble. So I think that some of these adjustments of deadlines have a lot to do with trying to work with what the public will tolerate to try to help keep the public as safe as we possibly can, and then to do our very best to be uh, in a role of educating and informing why this is so important. When will you know when to retighten the valve? This is a challenge. And so the president's reopening plan talked about a 14-day, mm -hmm. and we've talked about this, a 14-day downward. I, I did the wrong side. I learned this. The camera's <laughs> backwards. A 14-day downward decline. Uh -huh. um, we are working on trying to come up with a more real-time surveillance to track our own data for positive cases, 
um, and find when we see we may be resurging and having a problem. Uh, I think our best hope, though, is to adjust to a new normal. And then, of course, we're building testing capacity as rapidly as we can. Mm -hmm. We are building a, a contact tracing methodology and hiring hundreds of people to help us to do that task and, and bringing on technology to support us in that. We are going to have to hope that we can identify people who have infection fast enough, that the public understands the need for us to reach out to them and right. advise them what steps to take and to do that rapidly enough and for a long enough time that we can continue to return to some sense of normalcy while still allowing for the fact that we're going to have to interact with the public very differently to keep us safe. Do you believe there should have been a national strategy on reopening? I would have liked to have had much more cohesion across the country. I think it would have helped the nation much more if we had used solid science mm -hmm. and come up with a more standardized approach. I think what's happened now is you have individual states really struggling to do what they pretty much all need to do. This is not a party identification. This is not an ideology, whether they're Democrat or Republican, governors around. I mean, look at Ohio to the north. You have a conservative Republican governor and you have a Democratic governor here in Kentucky. They're doing largely the same things. The governors understand the need to try to be cohesive. The challenge is, though, since there's not cohesion across the country, they're all in a very difficult place trying to get the public to know which guidance to follow. I, I'm very proud of what we've done here. I think we've been very consistent, but it is a difficulty because when all of our sister states around us are taking slightly different approaches, it's understandable that the public at large can have a difficulty knowing what to follow. For the population that's 60 or 65 and older who have underlying health conditions, uh, it's still not recommended right. that they uh, gather in groups less than 10 or go to restaurants or what, what would you advise for that particular segment of the vulnerable population? Right, so I'm trying to do this from memory, but we have 350 to 360 deaths so far, I think. Mm -hmm. um, of that, more than half of that are over 80. If you get this disease and you are over 80, there's a very good chance this is fatal. And if you are over 60, your risk is substantially elevated. Um, it's not as high as being over 80, but for those individuals who are over 60 or have major medical problems, you should still stay healthy at home. Healthy at work and all the other variations, those are things society is demanding. Mm -hmm. But if you are over 60 or have chronic major medical illness, you really ought to stay healthy at home because it is about to become more risky for you than it probably has ever been as people start to socialize. What are public health experts like yourself learning about density and duration when it comes to the risk of exposure to COVID-19? Right, so I think this is why New York got hit so hard probably. The, when people are on the metro all the time, Manhattan, if anyone who's been in Manhattan, I don't know how you can socially distance there. Apartments, eateries, coffee houses, it is very, very packed in. When people are that close, we know, and we showed that on March, or on May 12th, rather, I think it was, the CDC slide that showed that one person infected, uh, was it 87% mm -hmm. of a choir? In two and a half hours of singing together, 87% 80, of the people there were infected. That's essentially what happens when you're on a subway or really close together. So I think when you have a very high density uh, population and a lot of people in a small area, that, that's particularly dangerous. That is the exact opposite of what we've said. Stay more than six feet away from each other, cover your face and your nose, um, and in, do enhanced hi hand hygiene. You're grabbing the handles on the metro and touching things and being close together and sharing air. Uh, that's really bad. So our big cities like Louisville mm -hmm. really faces a risk if this were to set through in Louisville. And also limiting uh, perhaps if you want to get your nails done and your hair done and you want to go to the tanning salon and the grocery store, you shouldn't do all those things in one day. Oh, well, certainly not. I think some of those things you probably, if you may be permitted to do that be, through Healthy at Work because society uh -huh. is asking for this. I would encourage people to think twice what they what is really important to them and whether they should go into some of these settings. Right. Um, and if they do go into them, I would look up the guidance we've put online. It's right on the website, right. kycovid19.ky.gov. Uh, KY you go to Healthy at Work, the tab, and click it. 
There's guidance for, for a whole variety of industries. I would encourage people before they seek services to read that right. and then to try to comply with it when they go there. And just going in different places, different venues, I would assume would expand your the possibility of being exposed, right? Remember being what I said in the people. beginning of this? What was that? Don't be a honeybee. You're right, don't be a honeybee. That's right. right. I forgot about that analogy. Right. So, yeah. so the close together, the choir is the buckshot model. People uh -huh. come together and one person infects a number and then they scatter and they spread it. And the don't be a honeybee uh, metaphor that I used is one person going place to place. So you can have super spreaders, one infected person who say gets up in the morning and goes to the grocery store and goes to the home improvement store and then goes to a restaurant and then goes and gets their nails done uh, and then goes and gets their hair cut and then comes home for dinner. If that one person has a high disease burden and wasn't wearing a mask and was spreading it everywhere they went, that one person could infect tens of people in one day. Yeah. Well, Dr. Stack, we thank you for your time. We never have enough of it, uh, and we will revisit with you again soon. But um, as always, best of luck to you and continued health. Well, thanks, Renee. So I urge everyone to stay healthy at home and healthy at work. So thank you very much. Good advice. Thank you, sir. Thanks.